when we meditate, when we practice in general, we're dealing with two kinds of truths. One is simply the truth of how things work. which is true regardless of whether you watch them or don't watch them, whether you pay attention or not, whether you understand them or not. These are the things, this is the way things work. When the Buddha said he discovered the Dharma, this is the kind of Dharma he discovered. But he didn't discover the Dharma just by observing things. He also dealt with what are called truths of the will, things that happen only if you will them to happen. That's when we sit down to meditate. You have to make up your mind. You're going to stay here with the breath. You're going to work on your powers of concentration. And you have to make it happen. If you don't make it happen, it's not going to happen on its own. Now these two kinds of truths have to work together. Your will has to take into consideration how things actually work. In fact, it's through willing something like this that you really learn about your mind. It's like when you cook. If you want to learn about eggs, you have to decide you're going to make something out of the eggs. You can't just sit there and watch the egg from morning to night, day after day after day, just looking at the egg and seeing what it does on its own. You crack it open. You put it on in a pan. You try different kinds of heat. You put water in the pan. You put oil in the pan. And you see how the egg reacts to what you do to it. And that's how you learn about cause and effect. So as we meditate, we're doing two things. We're learning how to observe and we're learning how to will in an intelligent way that takes into consideration what we've observed in the past and realizes that if you're going to learn more things, you also have to will more things. You can't just sit here and watch the mind as it wanders from this to that to the other thing and say, okay, I'm learning, I'm gaining insight and in practicing mindfulness. That's not what mindfulness is all about. Mindfulness is keeping certain things in mind. And what, one of the things you want to keep in mind is, one, what you've learned about the mind in the past, and two, what you've willed to do right here, right now. For instance, you're hoping to stay with the breath. You've got to keep watch over the mind to see when it wanders off, and then bring it back. In the meantime, you've got to learn, well, what does the mind like to stay with? How can I keep the mind fully engaged in the present moment? And here you find there are two aspects to the concentration you have to work on. One is having a focal point and then learning how to have a sense of the body as a whole and learning how to balance those things. Those are the two sides of the concentration practice. You want to stay with one spot in the body as your central focus. But you find as the concentration develops that, say, the sensation of the breathing at that central focus is going to get more and more subtle, harder and harder to keep track of. And this is where your ability to keep the whole body in mind and be aware of the whole body is going to give you a continuing foundation, because otherwise you get lost. Everything seems to disappear. That sensation of the breathing at the nose suddenly becomes less and less perceptible. The rise and fall of the abdomen gets less and less perceptible. You suddenly find yourself hanging in space. And if you haven't already worked on developing a sense of the body as a whole, it's very easy to lose your focus, to lose your foundation. So you want to develop both sides of the concentration. And you'll find as you 
work with the concentration. There's sometimes when having that one point of focus really has to be emphasized, and other times when the body as a whole has to be emphasized, and other times when you have to find out a way of keeping both in balance. And you learn this both by willing and by observing. Willing to find a good way to keep the mind centered in the present moment, and then observing to see what works and what doesn't work. Learning how to read the situation. Because it's only by poking at things that you see how they react. So many times people say, well, how should I do this? What should I do then? And a lot of it has to do with experimenting, seeing what works. But in the back of your mind, you've got the fact that you will. You want the mind to settle down. You want it to find a good foundation. And this connects with the whole process of taking vows. It's good. When you sit down to meditate, you make a vow, I'm going to stay right here. And then bring to that vow the qualities the Buddha said are important for any kind of determination. The first is discernment, making sure you're making a wise vow. And then once you've made that vow and you've determined that it is a wise goal that you want to set for yourself, then using wisdom and how you try to go about it what works and what doesn't work. And this is where the experimentation comes in, learning from your efforts in the past and trying to apply that knowledge to what's happening right now. And Sometimes you find, well, it doesn't quite fit. The lessons you learn don't seem to be working right now. That's when you've got to experiment. Use your ingenuity. When you find something that works, and the next quality you want to bring is truthfulness. You really stick with it. You don't sit here deciding you're going to meditate and then try to figure out a recipe for tomorrow's meal. You hold to your vow. Because if you can't trust yourself to hold to your vows, who are you going to trust anybody? And who's going to love you more than you do? Who's going to be more true to you than you are to yourself? And if you can't be true to yourself, if you're a traitor to your own best intentions, where are you going to find any safety in life? So when the Buddha is talking about truthfulness here, it's not simply a matter of saying true things. It's once you've made up your mind to do something true, you really stick with it. You really are true to it. It's a quality of the mind. It's a quality of the heart quality of the character the Buddha is talking about here. This is a point that John Lee makes over and over again. If you're not true to the Buddha's teachings, the Buddha's teachings are not going to be true for you. You hear them talking about concentration, but as far as you're concerned, it's just words. You hear them talking about discernment, release, it's just words. Unless you really do the concentration, you really stick with your determination. to give the Buddhist teachings a fair test. The third quality is relinquishment. Anything that gets in the way of your determination, anything that gets in the way of your vow, you've got to learn how to let it go, no matter how much you like it, no matter how much you enjoy it. As the Buddha said, a good test of your wisdom is when you know something is unskillful. It's going to lead to bad results, but you'd like to do it. Are you going to be able to tell yourself no and stick with that no? If you know something is skillful, it's going to lead to good results, but you don't like to do it. How can you basically make yourself say yes and stick with that yes? You're going to do it. You're going to see it through. So a lot of this has to do with relinquishing your, your likes and dislikes for the sake of what you really know is skillful or unskillful. 
was reading today, someone saying that mindfulness is all about just saying yes to everything that happens. Well, no, that's not the case. I mean, the Buddha's analogy for mindfulness is, is a gatekeeper and a fortress who's got to be very careful about who he lets in and who he doesn't let in. If you know there are spies, or if there's somebody there you don't really, you aren't really sure about, you don't let them in. Someone you know and trust, those are the ones you let in. So mindfulness is an important part of the faculty of judgment, so you can know what to abandon and what not to, what to develop and what to let go of. And the hard things are the ones where it's not a matter of blatantly skillful versus blatantly unskillful. Different levels of happiness. You know, you do this and it will give rise to a certain kind of happiness. When you do something else, it will give rise to another kind of happiness. Well, which one is the one you want to prefer? Not just over your likes, but which one is actually more reliable, which is a more solid and lasting form of happiness? Those are the places where the choices are difficult. But you've got to learn how to make them. You can't have your cake and eat it, too. When you're playing chess, you have to sacrifice some of your pieces. So you have to figure out which kinds of happiness are you going to sacrifice. So even though you might like to sit here making plans for next week, It's not nearly as useful as just staying right here in the present moment. The mind may complain that you're not really using your intelligence, but it's a different kind of intelligence you're working with here. The intelligence that knows how to stick with something that takes time to develop. The intelligence that realizes you've got to work on your powers of concentration if you want to see anything clearly. It wasn't until the Buddha got all the way into the fourth jhana that he was able to see things clearly in his mind, where purity of mindfulness and purity of equanimity allowed him to gauge things for what they really were. And if you haven't reached that point, you're not in a position where you can see things clearly. Are you there yet? Well, no. Okay, that means that your mind can't totally be trusted. Your perception of things can't totally be trusted. You've got to work. and learn how to bring things to stillness. And the kind of intelligence that gets you there, that's true to your vow and is able to relinquish anything that gets in the way of your vow, that's the kind of intelligence you've got to work on. The final quality the Buddha has you bring to all this is peace. In other words, not getting worked up over the fact that you've got to make an effort, not getting worked up over the fact that you've got to let go of things. You learn to calm your mind. Learn how to take joy in the fact that you're developing a skill. One of the things I had to learn in Thailand was how to sharpen a knife on a stone. It takes time, and you have to be very present. And you can't be in too much of a hurry. If you're in too much of a hurry, you ruin the blade. And so you have to find a way to keep yourself entertained with the fact that you're paying close attention to this blade. Keep yourself interested in what you're doing. And that way you don't get worked up over the fact that you may have you know, a long time before this blade is done. There's a great passage in Joseph and, and his brothers, where Joseph is going off to the prison. And the person in charge of the boat that's carrying him off to the prison is upset to see that Joseph is not miserable. And Joseph says, well, I'm making a story about this. I'm learning how to keep myself entertained about the fact I'm going to prison, but maybe this is not the end of my life. Maybe this going to prison is going to be an important part of my life. Just one chapter in a longer story. 
and that way he's able to maintain his calm. And so part of keeping yourself calm as you do this is learning how to tell yourself the right stories. Okay, you're facing difficulties, but hey, you faced difficulties in the past. Things may be boring, that's because you're not paying careful enough attention. Because here is your mind in the present moment. Everything in your mind is just laying itself out there on the table. Is that boring? Well, it may be not be what you want to see. You'd like to have nicer things on the table. But at least it is. There is your mind. There are subtleties you can look for here. I mean, there are lots of things that you can do to make this more and more interesting. And as it's more interesting, you find that you're letting yourself get more and more calm. That worked up over the fact that the past awakening can take a lot of time, it takes a lot of effort all your powers of observation, all your intelligence. But being on this path is much better than just wandering through the jungle, not knowing where you are or having any direction at all. You're following a path that's been followed by a lot of really good people in the past. And at least it has a goal, it has an end. Whereas there's nothing else in the world that has an end, all the jobs of the world. This is the time John used like to keep saying. When people finish work, so when they retire, it's not because the job is done, it's just they're too tired, too, too weak, too old to keep it up. The world's work never gets done. But the work of the training the mind does have a point of completion. And just thinking about that is enough to calm a lot of the fevers of the mind. So these are some of the qualities you want to bring to this process of developing truths of the will. You're developing a mind that's concentrated. You want developing a mind that's going to be a position where it can observe things more clearly. So you can combine those two kinds of truth, the truth of the will, truths of the will, truths of the observer. To take the mind to where you really want it to go, to a happiness that really is satisfying, that really is worth all the effort that goes into it. 